Effective change management in athletic training. Uh, Mr. Turk, most of you know him, the president of the RMATA. He's a senior lecturer and director of the athletic training education program at Northern Colorado, Go Bears. Um, he's the longtime Alex Trebek of the student quiz bowl. Uh, please help me in welcoming the well-read, well-spoken, sharply dressed, boyishly handsome Mr. Jim Turk. He forgot short. Um, I, I don't know what I did in my previous life to draw the short straw of 8 a.m. Sunday, but thank you for being here. Really excited to talk about this. Um, a lot of people have caught me in the hall and said, I'm really excited for your talk. I'm like, well, hope I don't let you down. So um, we'll see what happens. Before we get too deep into this, um, I do want to acknowledge the fact that this building sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, the Pueblo, the Navajo, and the Apache since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land through generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. To get started on this topic, I, I want to kind of disclose a few things. Um, you know, first of all, I am not by any stretch of an imagination an expert on change management. But if you'll indulge me for the next hour, can we just sort of pretend that I am? Um, that'll make my life a lot easier and I can sound a lot smarter than I really am. Um, a, a second acknowledgement, or excuse me, a second disclosure that I want to make. Um, when I was a kid, I grew up uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, listening to Car Talk uh, on NPR, which was quickly followed by What Do You Know? Um, so I'm going to paraphrase Michael Feldman and What Do You Know? All opinions expressed in this presentation have been painstakingly researched, although the rationales to support them may not necessarily have been. Ambiguous, misleading, and poorly worded opinions are par for the course. If you're a stickler for perfection, give your own presentation. Okay? Um, my last disclosure is I think I'm funny. I don't know what you think, but I think I'm funny. So I also have been told, and I'm probably acutely aware, that I can get going and talk really fast. So you've been warned. Fair enough. Beyond that, I don't really have any other disclosures. I don't have any financial stake in any of this. Um, I, I kind of put this idea together, uh, believe it or not, in, in kind of leading up into our 2020 ACS that didn't actually happen. Um, and I'm actually kind of glad that I didn't get the chance to give this talk then because a couple of things have happened in the world since then. So it really, it seems to be a more pressing topic um, than ever before. So I'm really kind of excited about that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to kind of sharing what I've learned um, in, in terms of digging into this process, and um, I hope you can get something out of it. Um, so when you've got a big bucket of change, right, to manage it, what we've got to do is we've got to use a machine like this, right? We're going to put those coins in, we're going to spin the crank, it's going to manage our change and put it into all the effective areas, and that's how we manage change, right? All right, I warned you. It's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about that kind of change management at all. Right? What we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about change that exists in business, change that exists in the profession of athletic training, change that exists in your world, whatever that looks like. And so I've got a couple of things that I hope to accomplish by the end of this morning. Um, we'll see how effectively I can do it or not. But the first thing that I want to help you do by the time you walk out this door, I hope that you can identify what are some models or strategies, ways to approach managing change, and then be able to take those ideas and translate them into whatever your athletic training clinical practice looks like, whether that's in the secondary school setting, whether that's in a college and university setting, in any of the emerging settings, as an educator, or maybe it's just how you manage change for yourself personally. I think that's probably more powerful and more impactful than something that might impact change in your clinical practice, but in some way, shape, or form, I hope that we can at least identify some of the models that are out there and how they might apply to whatever your career looks like at this point. So related to that, I'm hoping that when you walk out this door, you'll be able to describe what some of those strategies are in a little bit more detail. We're not gonna get super deep into a lot of those. I'm gonna kind of scratch the surface of some of the more um, widely used, some of the more contemporary models with a little bit of a kind of a historical back look at kind of how they were developed. But we're not gonna get deep into it prescribing how to exactly change anything. You've gotta figure that out leveraging some of these ideas and leveraging what, what people have learned in trying and inevitably failing in a lot of this change management. 
Um, I'm hoping that you can kind of start to do some of that. And so lastly then, is how do you assess change that exists in your world? Be that change that somebody like maybe a national credentialing organization might be imposing upon you. Change that you think you might need to initiate in your organization. Changing of activities, behaviors, thoughts in yourself. Whatever that change looks like for you, how do you assess what that change is and then how do you roll out and implement some of these strategies that we're gonna kind of talk about? How do you start to approach practically rolling out and implementing that change that you've identified as a need? Okay. So that's kind of where we're going. So in the profession, I think we've, you know, we're kind of getting stuck in this potential area where we want to be bold, we want to be innovative, but we don't really want to do anything different. We just want to be bold and innovative and all these buzzwords kinds of things, right? We don't want to do that. That doesn't work, right? We don't, we don't want to necessarily change, but we, we, we want bold, we want innovative, we want things to be better, but we're going to keep doing the same thing. Some smart guy named Einstein kind of coined that definition of insanity, right? It's doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting something to change. That isn't going to happen, right? But what we also know is that regardless of where you are, what you do, change is inevitable. Right? That is the one fundamental thing I think we can probably all agree on, that change happens. Things change constantly. Sometimes it's good change, sometimes it's bad change, but change is inevitable. There's one exception to change being inevitable, and that's from a vending machine. Um, it, sometimes you put a dollar bill in and you get your drink and you're supposed to get some coins back and that doesn't happen. Okay, I warned you. Thank you for not laughing because that's only gonna encourage me. It's eight o'clock on Sunday. Like, can we have a little bit of fun? Anyway, thank you. Thank you, David. So change is inevitable, right? Change is gonna happen. It's constantly happening. If we look back two years ago compared to today, things are very, very different. If we look two days ago to today, things are a little bit different. Change constantly happens, it's inevitable, right? But I hope that we can also agree that change is hard, right? Have you ever pulled a coin out of your pocket and tried to bend it? It's really, really hard to change. Oh, okay. Change is hard to do. We don't like change, right? That's just who we are as humans. We're gonna talk more about John Cotter a little bit later, but um, he's a Harvard Business School professor who has really, He's kind of looked at as, as one of the leading experts in organizational change, change strategy, um, and successful change strategy. And what he's learned in a lot of his work is that change is inevitable in business and change is hard in business. And what he's found out is change doesn't work in business. And about 70% of the time, there's needed change in the business world and it fails. It fails to be launched, it fails to be completed, or it doesn't actually happen very well, it's over budget, it's late, it doesn't accomplish what it intended to accomplish. We're talking Major League Baseball, all-star level of success at the plate, three out of 10 times a change strategy works, right? Would we accept three out of 10 success rate in patient outcomes? No way, right? That's not what we're striving for. We want 11 out of 10. We know that's maybe aspirational, probably not realistic, but the business world has realized that when you try to change something, 70% of the time, it isn't going to accomplish what you want it to accomplish for any number of different reasons. We'll talk more about kind of the, the work that he's done and how he's tried to impact that a little bit, and that's what I hope to kind of unpack a little bit this morning. But that's kind of the groundwork. I just want you to understand that about 70% of the time, this thing blows up in our face for any number of different reasons. But what does this have to do with that? We're talking business, right? This is not Harvard business, right? I'm not a businessman. I told you at the beginning I'm not an expert. This is not my, you know... We're gonna pretend that I am, but I'm not a businessman. You don't want me managing anything related to your business, right? But this does have direct applicability to healthcare and specifically direct applicability to athletic training, right? Hopefully this is not new or different to people in this room, but if it is, the Institute of Medicine um, really investigated things kind of late 90s, early 2000s to figure out why is healthcare broken? And what we realized is healthcare is broken because we're not teaching people the right way and the right things. And so they developed what have, we now refer to as the core competencies of healthcare education. They were initially embedded within the post-professional accreditation standards in athletic training. Now they are deeply embedded within the professional accreditation standards. 
I am teaching students the IOM core competencies in my program. Not because I have to, it's because it's what we do in healthcare, right? Their statement, health professionals should be educated to deliver patient-centered care as members of an interdisciplinary team. We focus on evidence-based practices, quality improvement approaches, and informatics, right? We can regurgitate that, we can spit that out, but if we look at really what they're trying to say, to me, one of the fundamental elements of the IOM core competencies to do what they're asking us to do is quality improvement. Quality improvement is at the core of delivering high quality patient care because it's good now, how can it be better tomorrow and even better the next day? That's the idea behind quality improvement. But I never learned what quality improvement was. Right? I may look like a, you know, a baby up here and I sometimes feel like a baby up here, but I'm still one of the holdouts. I, I went through an internship program in my undergraduate education. I didn't learn quality improvement. I barely learned athletic training knowledge and skill in the classroom. I learned a lot of it clinically, right? I was never taught this, but we're expected to do these kinds of things. That's the standard of care now, is to engage in continuous quality improvement, but I never learned it. So I wanna just unpack that just a little bit because I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding of what quality improvement is and maybe what quality improvement isn't. If you look at what the IOM said re related to that quality improvement element, and these are just some phrases, and I don't want you to read them, they're there. The big thing is really the last bullet point that's there, right? Healthcare professionals should be educated too. I have to teach my students to do so that they, when they go out in clinical practice, they do design and test interventions to change processes and systems of care with the objective of improving quality. If you look at that, what they're saying is we need to teach students how to change. So we gotta teach them how to change and we know that 70% of the time change doesn't work. The business world has told us that, right? John Cotter said, it's gonna fail. Seven out of 10 times it's gonna fail. But we have to teach students how to do that, which means we need to know how to do that, right? So we've gotta unpack the difference between quality assurance and quality improvement to understand what quality improvement is. And then once we understand what quality improvement is and we know that it's related to change and we know that 70% of the time change fails, how do I increase that success rate? Okay, so if we look at the definition of quality assurance, compare that to quality improvement, quality assurance is a systematic process of assessment. We're taking and looking at outcomes and saying, all right, let's examine that outcome. How do we do? Did it meet a benchmark or did it not? That's quality assurance. Right? Quality improvement tweaks that a little bit. And it says we want systematic and continuous actions, not assessment, actions, that result in measurable improvements in services and or status. Okay, that on paper might make some sense, might not. I'm more of a visual learner. So let me see if I can kind of articulate that with a couple of images, right? Let's just look at a standard distribution of outcomes and we plot the frequency of those outcomes relative to the quality of those outcomes, right? And it's just a standard distribution, bell-shaped curve, right? If we look at this bell-shaped curve and these outcomes, both the frequency and the quality of those outcomes, and we look at it through a quality assurance lens, what we do is we, after the fact, retroactively go back and we say, okay, this is the threshold for quality, right? Anything below this quality threshold is unacceptable to us. So quality assurance processes look to identify what didn't meet the benchmark, how can we eliminate those outcomes? Eliminate the frequency of those outcomes because the quality didn't meet our standards, right? That's what the KD does for my program. I ask them to assure the quality of the, of the education that I deliver to my students. They provide standards. I demonstrate that I've met those standards. They set those standards. That's the minimum benchmark. KD is not trying necessarily to ensure that I've got the best program that's ever existed in the world, although there's an element of that. Their primary focus is that they ensure to stakeholders, my students, that they know the type of quality that they're getting, right? But that's not what the IOM said. We're not teaching students to assure quality, we're teaching students to improve quality. So what's quality improvement? Well, let's take that same distribution of outcomes. Same frequency, same quality, bell-shaped curve, right? Quality improvement really looks to raise the bar and narrow the gap. And what I mean by that is, rather than setting a minimum benchmark criteria for success, let's look at our high achieving outcomes. What are the good outcomes that we're getting and figure out why are we getting those, but why aren't we getting those as often as we'd like to get them, right? Let's raise the bar of the expectation and now let's shift that curve to the right 
and narrow the width of that curve. It's raising the bar for quality and it's narrowing the gap of quality so that my best and my worst are a lot closer together and the overall mean is shifted to the right. That's quality improvement. Right? And that's what we're talking about with respect to change. Quality assurance is just simply cross-referencing, checking. Yep, did you meet it? Nope, okay, get that out of here. We're not sending that out into the marketplace. Quality improvement is really all about change. What are we doing differently to get a different result to raise the bar and narrow the gap? So quality improvement is all about small changes. It's little things at your local level. It's having an immediate impact on something, okay? It's not overhauling the system. It's not digging into and creating a total brand new system and let's take this and disseminate these generalized findings out to the masses. It's not, to, it's literally, if you've got something simple in your clinic, something that you're tracking and you see, okay, I'm, I'm getting these outcomes and why am I getting this particular bad outcome for this particular kind of thing? And I'm using these interventions and hoping to get these outcomes. Maybe I can tweak that intervention just a little bit. Maybe I'm doing ultrasound every single day and boy, they're just not getting better. Well, maybe, I don't know, let's tweak that just a little bit. Maybe I tweak parameter settings. Maybe I tweak the algorithm to decide you get it today, but you don't get it tomorrow. Or maybe doing some instrumented soft tissue mobilization strategy instead of, right? It, those are the things we're talking about quality improvement. It's not, well, I gotta blow up my PMP manual and let's start from scratch here and let's totally reorganize the whole deal. That's not continuous quality improvement, right? That's organizational change, certainly, but that's not what we're focusing on here. We're focusing on small things, little things, tiny little things, right? So to engage in continuous quality improvement, We've got to use this thing we call the model for improvement. Right? It's really just a simple three questions in a cycle. Right? All we have to do is ask ourselves three questions, and based on the response to those three questions, we kind of just sort of dig into a cyclical process to implement those answers. Right? So the first thing we've got to figure out is, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What's our aim? What's our goal? What's our intent? Right? What are we trying to do? Very simple, what's our aim? Related to that, whoops, that went fast. Related to that, we've got to look at measurement. How are we going to measure that aim? Right? I know what my target is, I know what my goal is. How am I going to measure that? How will I know if when I implement a change, it's been an improvement? I've got to measure something. And then lastly, I've got to look at what the change is. Right? I've got to identify a change. I've got to identify a strategy so that when I measure towards the aim, I can answer that question. And so based on those three questions, right, we identify an aim, we identify a measurement, we identify a change, we throw those into a strategy, right? We develop a plan, we implement that plan, we reflectively look back and figure out, okay, what went well, what didn't go well, what surprised us, what didn't surprise us, what have we learned from this? Okay, let's take that and put it into practice and see what happens and did that improve our quality or did it not? And it's a cyclical process, it's not a one-time thing, right? The idea behind, behind continuous quality improvement and these PDSA cycles, plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act, it should be all about incremental growth, incremental improvement, little things, right? Start with hunches and theories. Gee, I wonder if this might work. Try it. Because remember, we're not talking about overhauling the system. We're talking about making little tweaks. So if you have a hunch, you have a theory, develop an aim, develop a measurement, develop a change. Roll it out, see what happens. Change something small, small steps, right? Think about this in the idea of teaching someone to ride a bike, right? My son's 15 years old now, which is shocking and terrifying because he's got a learner's permit, so stay off the sidewalks if you're ever up in northern Colorado. But a few years ago, I don't know how many, too many to count, we tried to teach him how to learn a bike. And if you ever try to teach a child to learn how to ride a bike, you want to talk about PDSA cycles, boy, it's, it's something, right? You start with, okay, let's, we've got this grass hill next to our house. Let's just set him on his bike and see if he can roll down there without crashing. Nope, crash, fail. He was terrified. All right, um, let's try maybe, maybe I can push him across the field. Nope, that didn't work. I can't push him fast enough. He doesn't know what's going on. He can't steer the wheel. Okay, let's try something different. Let's go on a hard surface because grass isn't working. All right, buddy, what I want you to do is I'm just going to kind of just push you behind you while I can't run that fast. So he collapsed and fell. I said, okay, why don't you try it on your own? No, I'm scared, I'm gonna fall off. We went through all these plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act cycles, right? Making little growth, little change. You get some balance. You figure out how to pedal, right? 
eventually we get to the point where, hey, first bike ride he ever did on his own, right? He's quite a bit taller than that now. I know I'm short. I come from a long line of short people. My son's 15 years old. He's 5'11". So he's tall like his dad, and if I ever find that guy, I'll tell you what. <laughs> but it took a long way to get from him crashing in the field to riding his bike, right? It was baby steps. It was continuous quality improvement through plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act, right? That's what we're trying to do here. So if we look at what continuous quality improvement is, it's literally just trying to get from the current state to some sort of aspirational future state, right? And so an element of the Department of Health and Human Services, um, which was previously referred to as the National Learning Commission, they've kind of, kind of changed and become the, the uh, office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. It was a group that was formed part of the High Tech Act in 2009 that was really looking to try to overhaul and leverage technology within healthcare to achieve the triple aim of healthcare, to improve patient care, to improve population health, and to reduce the costs of doing that, right? And we're not gonna go down the triple aim and the missing aim, and all, but that's kind of where we are, right? So this is from kind of 2013, what, what they kind of rolled out with, right? It's going from the current state to the future state. Well, that requires change, doesn't it? Right, because if we do the same things over and over and over again and expect a different result, we've talked about that, right? So we gotta change to get from where we are to where we wanna be. Well, maybe you're not on board with the triple aim of healthcare, maybe that doesn't work for you, maybe that's not change that you're interested in, I editorialized a little bit and maybe here's what are some changes that we've got in athletic training, right? Maybe we've got a work-life balance issue, a burnout issue. That's got to change, right? Isn't that a future state that we might aspire to? Maybe we've got a compensation identity issue going on in this profession in certain settings, in certain geographic areas. There's maybe some certain disparities that exist, gender disparities, race disparities, location disparities, you name it, right? Isn't that a, a future state we might aspire to? Maybe you want to involve and engage, you know, inclusivity, diversity, access to care, parity in care, right? Maybe that's an area we aspire to. Maybe the BOC wants to figure out a way to actually have continuing education, continually educate us and improve the care that we provide to our patients. Maybe that's a, 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 an aspirational area of growth that we want to get to. Those are the kinds of things that we want to think about, regardless of, think about where you are, Think about where you want to be. We've got to have a process to get there. But if we don't understand quality improvement, and so with continuous quality improvement comes change and managing that change, this is what we do. Well, here's where we are, and then a miracle occurs, and here's where we are. It doesn't work that way, right? That's not how we solve a math proof, right? We've got to work through a process. We've got to go through some steps. We've got to figure this piece out. It's not about a miracle, right? So what we've learned is that to get from the current state to the future state. We've got to tweak people, we've got to tweak process, we've got to leverage technology in some way, shape, or form to get us from where we are to where we want to be. And we engage in a continuous process of continuous quality improvement. We meaningfully use three questions and a cycle, work our way through that to get from where we are to where we want to be, right? That's the idea, that's the goal, that's the theme behind continuous quality improvement. Okay, so that's change. That's what we're trying to talk about. But John Cotter said about 70% of change fails. And as they dive into why that change fails, what they've re realized, it's not a process that was designed poorly. It's not technology that's not set up to do what it needed to do. It's the human element that really is the fundamental gap in these continuous quality improvement strategies we don't often enough address the human element of change related to all of that, right? That's the biggest problem. If I ask this question, right, who wants change? Heck yeah, I wanna get more money. I want a better work-life balance. I want better outcomes for my patient. I want a better pass rate for my first, you know, first time pass rate for my students, right? We all want change. All right, cool. Who wants to change? Oh, that, that's kinda hard. And even harder, who wants to lead change? Who's coming with me? It's like, you know, it's like uh, in Animal House. Who's coming with me? Ah, no, that's not gonna work, right? It's hard, it's difficult. We said that, change is hard, we can't bend coins. Don't laugh, that's not funny, right? 
John Cotter said 70% of change fails, and what they realized is change fails not because of process, not because of technology. More often than not, it's because of the human element of that change. That's where we've got to jump in and, and, and dive into. So what's the human reaction to change, right? How do we perceive change? We deal with change constantly as humans, right? We're really, really good at adapting to change. It's just what we do, right? Adaptation is adaptation. It's what we're designed for. When we perceive change as being beneficial to us, we embrace it, right? We love it. Of course, it's intuitive. That's what we're going to, yeah, yeah. That change is helpful to me. I'm on board with that. But when we perceive that change is potentially going to have a negative impact on us, right? It's bad. What do we do? We resist it. We push back. And that resistance to change can look and feel a lot of different ways. Sometimes that resistance is just simple passive indifference, right? We're just like, meh, meh, whatever. Or you intentionally don't act. Or maybe you perceive the change is so bad that you actively sabotage that change. You actively work to resist that change, right? But if we really kind of dig into all of these change kinds of things, what we want to figure out is, are we resisting change or are we resisting being changed? Because we know that change exists. We said change is inevitable, but change is hard. We resist being changed more than we resist change. And so it's understanding that human element of that change, because remember, the human element is where it often fails. So what do we do to leverage fixing the being changed element? Because if we fix the element of resisting being changed, naturally, intuitively, as humans, we adapt to that change. Okay? So let's jump into a few of the kind of the change management models that are out there. And I'm going to very much hit the very superficial surface of a lot of these. There's a lot of literature to unpack with a lot of them. And I've only got an hour. I just want to hit the highlights on several of them and maybe kind of tie them back to healthcare a little bit and hopefully give you a starting point to jump into this change management idea for you. I'm happy to entertain some questions. I'm happy to have some hallway conversations in the three hours or so that we'll have left here on site. And I'll give you my contact information. I'd love to unpack this with you if you want to dive in more. So to start with, right, Peter Block, who is a, an author, a consultant, a speaker, he's really a, 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 an organizational developer, he's a community builder, he's a civic engager. Right? He came up with this idea um, in the early 90s of plotting the agreement with change and the trust relationship of the person within that change. And we use this a lot in this idea of what we call the agreement trust matrix. Okay? And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at through the human element of change if, if it, people are resistant to change versus resisting change, right? How can I identify who are the potential people that are gonna be more resistant to that change than others? And how can I leverage the people that aren't? In the ideal cir circumstance, right? What Peter Block realized is that people that are in agreement with a the change, they're behind it, and there's a good relational uh, uh, relationship that exists between us, right? He referred to those as allies, and it's allies to the change, right? They agree with it, they're on board with it, we've got a good relationship that's there, they're on board with it, they're supportive, we want these people in our corner, right? They're our advocates, they're our allies, they're the people that are going to help deal with some of that resistance to change that might exist from other people that aren't considered allies, okay? Staying in that kind of high trust area, that high trust neighborhood, right, are opponents, and opponents on the surface, it might look like it's a bad thing. They're not, right? Opponents are not a bad thing because we've got a great relationship with those people, right? There's a high level of trust. They just don't agree with a plan, an element of a plan, a change, an element of a change. I love opponents because they challenge me. They challenge the plan. It's not about having a conversation about, boy, we got to talk about our relationship, and I don't know if we're on the same page with life. We're just, we disagree about the plan. They're going to identify faults in the plan, identify problems in the change. They're going to help arguably strengthen what we're trying to roll out. And as we have those conversations through this element of trust, our opponents become our allies eventually through these continuous quality improvement, PDSA cycles, right? We, we easy to rally opponents and make them allies over the course of time. It gets a little bit more challenging when we start to lower that trust level, right? Tough people to deal with are bedfellows, in Peter Block's language, right? People that, you know, on the surface, like, oh, yeah, Jim, 
good change, love that change, that change's going to work. Are you kidding me? This guy's a freaking idiot. What the heck's he talking about? Behind your back, they're like, this is not going to work, right? They're either passively or actively resisting that change, not because they verbalize a disagreement with the change. It's a human element resistant to change for whatever reason. And we've got to get through that somehow. We've got to unpack that. We've got to build down, break down that barrier. We've got to fix that. Sometimes we can turn bedfellows into allies, but we got to fix the trust, right? Because we're aspiring to that, that top right corner there, the allies, right? To get opponents there, we just fix the plan, right? We fix the change. To get the bedfellows there, we got to fix the relationship. And then if we look in this bottom left corner here, right, our adversaries. These are the tough nuts to crack, right? Because you've got a problem with the change. You've also got a problem with the person. Sometimes you just don't reach these people, but you want to know who they are, right? And you want to know how they might sabotage some of your change efforts, and it is what it is sometimes, right? We can't get everybody to agree all the time. We can get some people to agree all the time, and we can get everybody to agree some of the time, but we can't get everybody to agree all the time. That's just the reality. And so we want to know the rules of the, of the game, right? That's what's at stake. So that's Peter Block's model called the Agreement Trust Matrix. And that, just very simple, straightforward, it's just categorizing people. And so when you're rolling out change and knowing that there's human resistance to change, who am I dealing with and how am I going to deal with you based on who you are, based on agreement, based on trust? If we leverage that just super simple concept, maybe we can raise that 30% success rate in change. Maybe not. Maybe there might be more to it. But that's a super simple, easy way to go about that. Right? Now, Digging into it a little bit more from, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a human psychology expert, but remember we said we're going to pretend that I am for an hour, right? If we go back to the 40s and we look at Kurt Lewin, who is really one of the very first sort of organizational change examiners. He was actually a physicist and a social scientist, and he came up with a fantastic analogy to talk about the change process, the human change process, and use the analogy of a block of ice, right? If we want to change a block of ice, you don't just take out your chisel and start just banging away at the ice, right? Because you end up with less ice than you started with because flakes are going off everywhere. And that's not what we're looking for. He said, rather, take that block of ice and let's unfreeze it, right? Let's take the current state and everything that's in that current state and let's unfreeze it. As we unfreeze it, it becomes liquid, right? Well, liquid, we can do a lot more with. We can reshape, reform, move it around, change its shape, no problem, right? He referred to that as the transition phase. We unfreeze the current state, we transition towards that new aspirational state, and once we're there, boom, let's lock it in. I took that ice cube, turned it into a popsicle. Summer's coming soon, I hope. I love me some popsicles, I love the, like the Otter Pops. I, I can crush boxes of those, but unfreeze, transition, refreeze. Super simple analogy to talk about doesn't necessarily tell you how to unfreeze, what you do during the transition, how you refreeze it, but it's a starting point, right? It's a jumping off point conceptually to say, okay, I've got a current state, I've got an aspirational state, I gotta make ice liquid to get it to ice again. That's a simple way to approach change management, and if you think through that, and then we'll talk through some of the human elements of that, we can increase that 30% success rate a little bit. So, taking that idea of Lewin's unfreeze, transition, refreeze strategy, right? And we fast forward a little bit, right? There was a group um, that was founded by a, a Bell Labs engineer and program manager. His name was Jeff Hyatt. And so in the early 90s, he started to investigate failure of change in his organization. And he thought, hmm, I wonder if I can figure out why we're failing at changing. And he's like, yep. It's about the people, right? It's a personal change process. And so he'll, as a little bit of an entrepreneur, a little bit one of those kind of you know, life coach minded sort of rah-rah type of people, he came up with an acronym that he refers to as ADCAR, the ADCAR Steps for Change. And he's founded a company that's actually based out of Loveland, Colorado, ironically, um, which is like 15 miles from where I live. Um, it's called ProSci. And, and what they do is they, they go out to the business world and they sort of preach this ad car, personal growth, personal change strategy. And really it's got a perfect parallel 
and a perfect complement to the work that Lewin started back in the 40s, right? They refer to the unfreezing process in ADCAR as, let's talk about the current state. Examine your current state. And, and this, the, the work that Ad, the, the ADCAR kind of process, the ADCAR steps, it's really more focused on personal change, more so than organizational or structural or those kinds of things, but, but it, it translates. If we look at the current state and unfreezing that current state, in order to unfreeze that, there has to be an awareness that change is necessary. You have to be internally acutely aware that change is necessary, right? So you have to know that you need to change, but then the next step of that is you have to want to change. There has to be a desire. So the A, awareness, the D, desire, that parallels with Lewin's kind of unfreezing where you are, right? So be aware that you need to change. That means you gotta be clued into things that are going on around you and like, ooh, I kinda might need to get on board with that. I want to get on board with that. It's not just I, I, I might need to, I want to. Awareness and desire. When we've got the awareness for change and the desire to change, now we have unfrozen our current state and now we're getting into this liquid form, right? And this liquid form they refer to as the transition state, right? Much like what Lewin described, right? They're talking about transition. So in this transition state, now we've got to have a knowledge on how do I change? What do I do to actually change myself? Where do I find knowledge about change? How do I learn how to change? And as I gather that knowledge, I develop the ability to change. So now that I've had the awareness that I need to change, I want to change, I know how to change, I learn the ability to change, I go through that process of transitioning my old state towards my new state, I'm taking that liquid, I'm putting it into the popsicle form, right? Now we gotta throw it back in the freezer, right? Now we gotta refreeze that current into the new state. They refer to it as their future state, right? That future state is reinforcement. It's really easy to change. It's really hard for change to stick. If you've ever tried to do something, right? I like endurance activities. I like exercise. I like cycling and running and those kinds of things. I can get myself to an aspirational state of fitness and it's really, really hard to reinforce that state, right? Take that same analogy to your personal change, right? It's really easy to get right up and you're kind of right at that aspirational state. Whew, man, that was a lot of hard work. Whoa, let me kick back and boop, right back to where you started again, right? That's failure of change. That's why 30% of the time we're successful and 70% of the time we're not, right? It, that reinforcement piece is a huge element of that. And so there's some strategies to, to dive into to reinforce that change. So, so I've got lists of references kind of towards the end here. That ADCAR strategy is, is a really relatively simple sort of next step from the Lewin change management strategies that he talked about, about unfreeze, transition, refreeze. Okay. Well, taking that a step further, let's talk about John Cotter. Okay. So John Cotter, who is a Harvard business professor, really is now kind of looked at as one of the leading experts in change management and successful change management. And so he's kind of taken a similar track to what Lewin started, what Hyatt and his group at ProSci have kind of built upon, and he's kind of developed sort of this eight-step process, right? We've got, to, we've got to have numbers and steps, and it's, you know, buzz rate, whatever. He's got eight steps of change management. And if we superimpose those over the Lewin followed on by the ADCAR process, you see a lot of parallels, and we're seeing a theme here of what change management looks like. Right? So what Cotter advocated for is, okay, this idea of unfreezing or the current state, awareness, desire, right? They refer to this, how do we create a climate for change? It's not, let's just go change, right? We gotta set the stage, we gotta lay the foundation, we gotta create a climate where, of course we're gonna change, because remember, people don't resist change, right? They resist being changed. So how do we create a culture where they're not resistant to being changed? Because change is gonna be happening. We said it's inevitable but it's hard, right? So Cotter said the first thing you've got to do to create a climate for change is you've got to create a sense of urgency. You've got to get people to understand, well, if we don't do this, here's the outcome, right? You've got to make it urgent for them to change, right? That's all about that awareness element, that desire to change. Create a sense of urgency. That's the first step in creating this climate for change. As you're building that sense of urgency, right, you're starting to build your allies. You're also starting to build your opponents a little bit, 
Those are good things, right? Let's get a coalition of change agents. Let's get some like-minded, like-thinking, like-trusting individuals who are on board with this urgency kind of thing, and let's get a group together. Power in numbers, right? Now this idea for this culture for change is starting to grow. It starts with one, it's growing, it's evolving, it's changing, right? As you get enough people together, you got a lot of allies, a few opponents, right? Now we're developing a vision and a strategy. Now we're coming up with a game plan. We're getting this culture created. We gotta take this culture out to the organization at large. How are we gonna do that? What's our game plan? What's our strategy? Another reason change doesn't fail is the human element of that is we have a bad plan for change, right? We have a bad plan of implementing that change and it's a human failure, it's not a process failure, right? So let's get a good vision, let's get a good strategy. So we take that there, we've got a good culture and climate for change, now how do we take that to the organization? Well, we've got to engage the organization, get them bought into the climate, bought into the culture, but we've also got to enable them to change. We've got to give them the tools, give them the ability, not just give them the climate, not just get them excited about it, actually operationalize it. So to do that, we take this vision that we've created in our cultural shift, right, and we communicate it out. And that communication piece is probably one of the more challenging elements of that. And we're going to circle back to that idea of communication. It's not a top-down, one-way communication street. It's both ways. It's top-down, bottom-up, inside-out, outside-in. It goes in all directions, right? That communication element, we're going to circle back to that here in a, in a little bit. As we've communicated that vision, now we've got to empower people to take action on that vision. Give them the tools to roll out that change. We get them to buy into the change, they buy into that change, they do that change, and get some quick wins. Remember this is baby steps, little things, small things. Get some quick wins. As you keep empowering action, getting quick wins, empowering action, getting quick wins, empowering action, getting quick wins, that builds, that grows. Now we're engaging, we're enabling the organization, but now we gotta freeze the popsicle, right? We've unfroze it, we've got our liquid, we're molding it, let's throw it back in the freezer. What does that look like to reinforce it, right? How do we implement and then sustain that change? So let's take those little wins that we get and let's celebrate them. Let's leverage those through continuous quality improvement. Hey, I didn't fall when you pushed me, Dad. Let's try it again, I wanna pedal this time, right? It's leveraging those little wins, rallying the excitement, getting people excited about the success that we've had now it becomes the culture. Cultural shifts are really, really hard. It's like trying to turn a cruise ship, right? You don't turn on a dime. It's long, it's slow, it's painful, right? But you gotta celebrate the little wins, leverage those little victories. They grow, they grow, they grow. We got a cultural shift, right? That's what Cotter sort of advocates, and it really makes a lot of sense. But keep in mind, John Cotter, Harvard business professor. He works in the business world, right? We don't, we're working in healthcare, right? So how does this translate to healthcare? How can we take all of those models, all of those things from, you know, agreement trust matrix, Lewin's three steps, ADCAR, Cotter, how do we do all that? How do we kind of put it all together? I don't have all the answers. There's some good literature out there that's being worked on in terms of how do we translate this into healthcare. There's a group at um, the Mayo Clinic who's starting to dive into, they're actually public health researchers at the Mayo Clinic that's starting to publish some research on translating change management strategies to healthcare, right? So this one particular paper, it's from 2010, does a pretty good job of kind of laying out a sort of a generic framework for approaching change management through the lens of healthcare, right? And so what they say is, okay, we gotta start with somebody. We gotta start with a leader. They've gotta be the one that's gonna start that change, right? So to do that, they've gotta analyze the climate, right? They've gotta look at the current state. Asking those questions, what's our aim? What's our measurement? What's our change, right? Three steps, or three questions in a cycle, right? Are we ready for change? What's our climate like? Where are we? How do we establish that sense of urgency that John Cotter said is important, right? What do I do to do that? Small conversations, true rumors going around, right? Let's, let's just kind of plant some seeds. Let's see what happens here. As we gather that coalition of change agents, right? Let's put together a close group of, of individuals that want to start a cultural shift, that want to be a part of this continuous quality improvement process, right? From there, 
We need to build that steering team, and that steering team is going to be tasked with that vision, right? That developing and implementing a plan. All right, we see in that there's a need for change. We've got a desire. We're ready. Let's build a plan. So that steering team then comes up with a plan. Well, we've got to roll that out. So now we've got to find some people that may not be those early resistors to change. Who are the allies? Who are the opponents? Right? Let's roll that plan out to them in a pilot group. We don't need to change everybody and change everything. Let's change a little thing with a little group of people and see what happens. Let's go through that pilot process. Let's plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act, and see what happens. As we do that, and we make those continuous quality improvement growth kinds of things, right? Now we spread that out, right? People are rallying behind that. We're celebrating these little wins. We're leveraging that celebration of the little wins, working towards a cultural shift, right? We share the good news. We disseminate that out. And then we anchor it in the organization, right? So you can see the change is growing. It starts with one person and one idea. And it's growing through people. And we're leveraging those people. Because remember, it's the people that fails. It's not the process. It's not the technology. More often than not, it's the people. But remember, we said communication is fundamental to all of that. It's bottom up. It's top down. It's outside in. It's inside out. We've got to be communicating with and among everybody in the process, regardless of where we are. Right? An example of that, right? In our pilot group, right, we're going through this PDSA cycle, right, constantly, just cyclically, going through it, going through it, going through it. That's feeding back and informing our, informational, our implementation of our plan, right? We're learning from it. We don't always have successful PDSA cycles. Sometimes it doesn't work and it's a colossal failure and we've got to go back and start from the beginning, right? Sometimes we go backwards. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that because we're trending up eventually, right? It's not a linear upward trajectory. It's ups and downs with a trend up. It's like the stock market, right? It just keeps going up. There's good days and bad days, but it's trended up. But maybe it's not the plan. Maybe it's the organization. The more people we get involved, the more likely it is that we're going to run into issues. Because remember, it's the people more so than the process of the technology. Learn from our organization. Let's get our organization and communicate back down. Maybe it worked in the pilot testing. But when we rolled it out, company-wide, organizational-wide, group-wide, nope, we didn't think about that. Let's learn from that. Feed back into the plan, right? It's all part of that upward trajectory, but we've got to communicate all of that as we go. So in summary, and I've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to save some time for, change, or time for questions. Change is inevitable, and change is hard. But keep in mind, it's people not resisting change, it's people resistant to being changed. Think about the people in these change management processes. Your plan will work if people make it work. Change is going to fail if we don't have a plan, but change is more likely to fail and that plan is more likely to fail if that plan doesn't focus on the people, on the human element, right? Don't focus on the process, don't focus on the technology, that'll come part and parcel with the people, focus on the people. That's what the business world has told us to make change management successful, is look at people, look at the human element of that, focus on that, and you'll improve that 30% success rate. And I think the biggest thing in summary is that the success of change efforts is at the heart of continuous quality improvement. We can't improve quality if we don't change. And if we don't change effectively, we won't improve quality. So we've got to adapt business-minded or business-founded change management strategies. We are not reinventing the wheel here. It's been done before. We just got to make it work for us in athletic training. So how do we adopt people-oriented change management practices to improve that 30% success rate? And if you look at what some of the changes that are going on in our profession is, that's where we are right now. I know it's a hot button item for a lot of people. What the BOC is implementing with the changes to continuing education requirements. Who are they engaging right now? Us, right? They've got a process. They've got technologies to leverage to roll out that process. They want this change to be successful because they've created the vision, they've identified the need, they're changing the culture, but they gotta get all of us 
to buy in. It's natural to resist that change when you identify that it's potentially a bad change. You don't understand the change. You don't get it. That's why the BOC is doing a great job of having these conversations, right? They're reaching out to us. They're engaging us. They're looking at us as people. They're not shoving the process down our throats, right? People don't resist change. They resist being changed. And we're being changed right now. And so they, they acknowledge that. And they're engaging in these strategies, whether we realize it or not. Right? I know that's a lot to unpack. Um, and it's 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning after a long weekend. I get that. What questions can I entertain? Exactly what I expected. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Great presentation, speaking in line with how I feel. What are some suggestions for the group on what they can do individually and within their organization to start the ball moving forward? Fantastic question. Um, started it with the fact that, I, once again, I am not an expert at this, right? I, I, I'm just now starting to dig into and, and comprehend a lot more of the literature that's out there. I think the biggest strategy and hopefully that's been the theme, it's about people. Find people that are aware and desire change. I really like that ADCAR model a lot. I think that's a great starting point for wherever you are in your change journey, is be aware that you need to change and figure out a desire to change. It's get like-minded people together, surround yourself with like-minded individuals, surround yourself with allies and opponents. It's find that trust group, that's the good starting point. So Adam, I hope that kind of answers the question. It, it, it's all about people. That's, that's where it's gotta start, because if we address the people element, the process and the technology just come part and parcel with it. Um, do you have any advice if stakeholders or members of the sports medicine team, like athletic director, coaches, aren't on board? <laughs> So in those types of circumstances, and, and, and I chuckle because, I mean, that is the reality. And it's not that they're not on board with the plan per se. It's, it's the human element of it, right? It's, it's we've got, I, I love, it's so simple, but I love that, you know, the, the, the Peter Block um, agreement trust matrix. Who are they? Why aren't they on board? Is it, are they not on board with the plan and we've got good trust and they're an opponent? And okay, let's talk about the plan. What is it that you don't like about the plan? What am I not seeing that you're seeing? What are you not seeing that I am seeing? Let's have that conversation. Those are, that's great. When you're dealing with bedfellows or adversaries, that's a tougher nut to crack, right? Because we've got to address either the relationship and or the plan. And those are tough. I, I don't have, I wish I had the silver bullet, you know, million dollar answer for you. But I think if we look at the, in that agreement trust matrix, the common theme of the good guys, if you will, is it's the relational aspect. The plan's the plan. We'll tweak on that, we'll work on that. That's the PDSA cycle. Let's roll it out, try it, see what... If we don't have that trust relationship, it, it's not gonna work. And so it's really separating yourself a little bit out from the disagreement specifically with that change. If there's trust issues, let's, let's unpack those. Let's dig into that, and we'll, we'll, we'll set this change aside for a little bit. Let's talk about us. Why are we not on the same page personally? And let's get there. Now your bedfellow or your adversary becomes either an ally or an opponent. And those are the productive conversations that we can have. So it's, it's not a direct answer and I don't have a good direct answer, but, but I love that sort of agreement trust matrix model when you're dealing with those interpersonal relationship kinds of things. It's trying to kind of find where on the matrix they are and address the deficiency. Hey, Jim, great talk. Thanks, um, Jimbo. So I think this is a perfect talk at the end of a conference <laughs> because people leave conferences with all these ideas. And I think we all know, especially people that are in the room that are seasoned, it's really hard to take your ideas back and put them into practice. So it's a great way to leave people. And I, this is largely for all of us that are seasoned in the room, but also 
upcomers is, is I think what you have to do when you have some ideas like a conference leaves you with is prioritize what you want to put into practice. Take one thing, work on that, but, but you can't. You can't take everything that you learn at a conference and put it back in, but, but what, what, what is one thing you can do? And, and then I, I, love, I love the plan, do, act, review. I, I, I use it. And, and again, if you, can, if you can take one thing away, it's just like, just, just try to do that one thing. Because it, it is, it's all overwhelming. But, but what, do, what do you do? Just one thing at a time. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Baby steps. We're not talking big things here. Just baby steps. It's like Bill Murray. Mashed potatoes and gravy, Marie. I couldn't be happier with baby steps. I have a question, Jim. Oh, hi, Jen. Um, so in this framework, we're talking about organizations who are wanting to make change. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the organization is not ready to change, but people want the change. So I'm curious mm -hmm. what you've come across in your, you know, how your steps apply differently when the people are advocating for the change as the starting point. Fantastic question and, and really interesting. I think if, if I go back for a second here and we look at this sort of framework, uh, let's see, let's see, I'll go back, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we look at this framework, right? Leader doesn't mean organizational leader. It doesn't mean CEO, it doesn't mean president, it doesn't mean chairperson of the board, it doesn't mean dean, it doesn't mean faculty, it doesn't mean head athletic trainer, it doesn't mean director of sports medicine, it means leader of change, right? And so I think, we, we, don't, we want to be careful in getting wrapped up in an organizational structural limit to this. You don't know you're a leader until people follow you. Leadership is not vested in a title. Um, and so if the people want change, create a sense of urgency, establish a steering team, develop an implementation plan, pilot it, roll it out, and hey, it's bottom-up organic change. You're a leader. You don't have to have a title to lead. So I, 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 I don't come across a lot of that in the literature, but I, I, think, you know, I think if you just sort of look at this through a different lens, we're all change agents if we want to be. If we've got an awareness and desire, that starts the changing of the climate. Question here, Jim. Appreciate the conversation. It's, it is an awesome one, and I was excited to hear this. So thank you for doing a great job of making those visual, visuals easy to understand. And um, if you don't mind pulling back up that agreement trust one, I wanted to make just one comment and maybe ask for opinion and um, I'll get there. Give discussion. me a second. And by the way, I'm impressed on how you did that. I mean, I, I'm happy to get one picture on a slide, let alone. <laughs> so I think um, we just had a good question about this bottom-up approach versus um, like an organizational down approach. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to weigh in here a little bit on what I see on a national level. And I think that we as a profession are developing a trust issue within the profession because we don't agree. And I'm going to take that one step further, and I think there is a, a breakdown of agreement that we're missing, right? And that's uh, at least the way that I kind of run this. It's are we communicating, right? Do we like each other? And do we have the same reality? And until we have those things, we will not agree. And so, and if we don't agree, we will push down our level of trust and therefore our change management is not gonna work, right? And so I'm opening that discussion and I'm thanking you for doing this presentation that I think we, are, we have to be careful within and without the profession, outside the profession, what our trust looks like and what I think we've leveraged so long as a profession and why our patients love us is because they trust us and why we love each other is because we trust each other and we're affecting that right now because we're not agreeing. And so I am open to the discussion that the plans we have going forward need that communication and that understanding to get the agreement or else we're gonna push the other side down. So thank you very much. Yeah, fantastic comment. Trust the two-way street, no question. It goes both ways. Um, and yeah, th thank you, David.
So, so here's my contact information. I've got a laundry list of references if you want to see them. I, I'll, I'll put them up if you want, but really reach out to me via email. Give me a call. Um, I would love to unpack this conversation a lot more. I don't have all the answers, but I love unpacking some of that. So thank you so much.